I am run the CoffeeScript post-processor on them and send down standard JavaScript to execute inside the browser. Uh, likewise, if you want to use less, uh, which is a CSS higher level language. Um, so for example, with the nice thing about less is instead of having to hard code strings, uh, values all over the place, you can define variables like brand color and then reuse them in multiple style sheet rules. Uh, again, I can just register a custom post-processor for less and then just link to the less script and this is what it looks like after it's been expanded by less into separate rules, merged and minified by ASP.NET and sent down to the browser. So a really easy way, improve your performance of your site, you can more easily integrate things like less coffee script, SAS, and other things uh, into your system, get better perf, and have a really nice developer workflow. And the nice thing is it's just built in and you can take advantage of it. So that's uh, a little bit of bundling minification. It works not only for MVC, it'll actually work for web forms as well. Uh, so you can take advantage of it, any type of ASP.NET app. Uh, hopefully provide some nice develop, developer productivity. And it's pretty easy to use and, and get big wins from it. How many people here use Razor today? A lot of people do. It's a new templating language we introduced with MVC3. Um, and uh, it's really great. It makes it allow you to write really uh, concise, terse code. Uh, and um, it's a lot of fun to use. A couple of things that we've done with this uh, uh, new MVC release is actually updated Razor to have a few more features. And we've looked really hard at what are the types of patterns that people do over and over with Razor. And anytime we see something where it's a little verbose, we try to make it simpler and a little bit more elegant. Uh, one thing we noticed a lot is that people often uh, have hard-coded URLs or have to do, actually not hard-coded URLs, but they want to basically have relative URLs that they fully qualify within their code. An example is using URL.content to reference a site.js relative to the root of the project. Um, and so anyone here ever used URL.content or server.mappath or things like that? Yeah. Uh, what you can do now inside Razor is you no longer have to call any function in order to do it. You can just use the tilde syntax within any HTML element and Razor will automatically expand that at runtime to be the fully right qualified uh, URL for you automatically. Uh, so again, it just makes it a little bit simpler, a little bit easier uh, to um, work with URLs and um, take advantage of within your app. How many people here ever write code like this in Razor, which is kind of nasty code, uh, which is basically where I want to conditionally show an attribute on an HTML element and assign a value to it. And Razor for today allows you to do really elegantly just you to put an if else block inside your HTML and it's smart enough about parsing where the HTML starts and ends and makes it really elegant. Where it's not so elegant today is if you do that inside an HTML attribute that you want to conditionally show or not. So in other words, if this class isn't set, I want to hide the, um, the actual uh, class HTML element so that there's nothing on the element. And this is kind of how you do it today, which is not very intuitive and not very clean. What you can do now with the new Razor is you just say class equals at my class and the Razor parser is smart enough so if it's an HTML element and the value is null, it won't actually output the class either. And so this would actually just be div content if no CSS is actually present. Uh, and if you want to be really clever, you can even say my class space my other class. And if you want to use with CSS multiple class names, which is a feature that CSS supports, Razor is also smart enough to support that as well. Again, just saves you some typing, makes it a little bit cleaner, allows you to write really elegant, clean code, just built in with, uh, with the next uh, version of Razor that comes with MVC. How many people here use a database? Uh, what are the people that don't raise their hand? What do you do, actually? Uh, but anyway, a um, uh, couple of you will do. Uh, and, um, uh, that's great, um, and we want to make that better. Uh, so one of the other features that's new in MVC4 is support for what we call database migrations. Um, and so one of the things we did in MVC3 is we shipped EF Code First by default uh, with the tooling update that we did last spring. Uh, EF Code First is um, a really kind of nice um, iteration of the entity framework ORM. Uh, it supports a kind of convention or configuration-based uh, object relational mapper. Uh, allows you to kind of, with code, uh, to cleanly define your models using kind of what we call plain old CLR objects or POCO objects. Uh, and with MVC3, we had a bunch of tooling support that allowed you to easily kind of scaffold controllers and views based on it. Gives you a lot of nice dev productivity, lets you write some really clean code. Uh, one thing though that, that you, know, you still have to today manually handle yourself is what happens when you're doing development and you want to evolve the database schema. So in other words, 
you want to add a property, you want to rename a property, you want to change something from uh, non-nullable to nullable or vice versa. Uh, today, you're going to have to manually handle that. And writing the SQL change script by hand that preserves all the data inside the database is kind of a pain. And there's lots of tools out there that help with it. Uh, but what we tried to do with this release is bake in uh, support automatically to make it a lot easier, uh, make it code focused, make it dev friendly. But at the same, at the same time, also allow it so that after you as a developer have changed your app schema, you can also still automatically generate a dot standard dot SQL file that you can give to a DBA who can look at it and make sure you didn't do anything stupid, um, or that you can import into the SQL management studio and actually run against your production database to actually migrate your data and migrate your schema without losing anything. Uh, and we call, uh, this is just sort of built in, and you can take advantage of it. So uh, I'm going to show this off using uh, MVC4. One tip, uh, the beta that's available today has a version of the Entity Framework that's uh, a couple weeks old. Um, the Entity Framework just actually shipped the final release of 4.3 a couple days ago, uh, and it actually has migrations built in. So this is actually a shipping released feature uh, that you can use not just inside MVC4, but you can use it in MVC3 now, as well as within web forms or any other project type. Uh, the one tip is just make sure you do an update, update package entity framework when you load your project to make sure you pick up the new version uh, that has this new feature. So oh, let's not show that. Um, let's go back to our red shirt app. Just, uh, let me close that. So we're back in our red shirt app. Um, and uh, Let's do some data. What type of database do you want to build? What data do we want to store in our red shirt project? T-shirts. <laughs> uh, how about we call them products? Uh, and we'll have different types of shirt products that we can do. So um, we'll, we'll create a product.cs class. And I'm going to add it in my, uh, hopefully, I added, oh, I added it in the wrong place. I'm going to add it in my models folder. Uh, and um, we'll create a database around it. So I got a product class. It's in my models folder. Uh, let's just start off, and we'll add a few properties. We'll have an ID property. We'll do a name property. That's enough to start off with. So we've got two properties. And what I want to do here is I want to build a site and a database around my products. Uh, and so with MVC3, we added support so you can scaffold controllers automatically. So I just right-click, say new uh, products controller. Uh, I'm going to say scaffold it based on the product class. And I want to create a store DB context. Uh, and I'm going to hit add. So this is actually all shipping and built into MVC3. And what this is doing now is creating for me a uh, entity framework um, uh, class as well as a set of files in order to do it. And remember how I said don't forget to update your entity framework? I did forget to update it. So I'm going to do one other thing before we run it, uh, which is type update package into the framework. And so I'm just going to use the NuGet command line to make sure I have the latest version of the entity framework when I run this. Uh, and you can see here it just updated it. Uh, but because I've already opened the old version, I do need to actually reopen the project in order to pick up the new version. And then we'll actually go ahead and run this and uh, see it in action. So redshirt four, there we go. So uh, we got controller scaffolding. We got view scaffolded. Again, this is what the code looks like. This is just standard MVC three. Uh, and when I go ahead and run this app now and hit the slash products controller, uh, you can see here this is the page that we scaffolded. I can just say create new, and we'll say redshirt. Uh, and because there's actually multiple types of red shirts, we have red polo shirts. Um, and orange shirt, given that where we're at. Uh, and away we go. So we had a couple, couple rows of data inside our database. One of the beauties about EF Code First is you can start with your code. And you might be wondering, how did this get stored? Well, it actually, if you go to our database um, and... Um, open up a dot SQL express, and I basically search for it here. You can see here we have redshirt4.models.database, 
And if I open this up, I got a products table that has two columns in it, and it's storing those three shirts. So that's all works in the existing version of Entity Framework. That's great. Uh, but what I want to do now is I want to evolve this database schema because my store actually needs to have prices as well. And that's where today it's not as elegant. And with the new database migration feature that's built into MBC4, it gets a lot cleaner. So how do we do this? Well, what I want to do is uh, add another property to my POCO model here. Um, but I want to keep the data, I want to evolve the database without having to regenerate, and I want to keep all those three red shirts that I upload, or the two red shirts and one orange shirt in my database as I do so. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to type a command called enable migrations inside the uh, command console. And what this is going to do is, if I go back to my solution explorer now, is it added a couple of files into my project. It created a migrations folder right here. And it has a configuration file that just has a couple of properties that you can change. And it has a uh, class that it automatically generated here, uh, which is called my initial create class. Um, and uh, there's a little weird number before it. That's a timestamp. Uh, and so you can see what order the migrations run in. And basically inside this method here, it has what's called an up and a down method. Um, the up method basically contains the code necessary to create the database in the current state of both my uh, POCO class as well as my current database. And so you can see here, we created a table called products that has two properties, uh, two columns, and a primary key. Um, the down actually just drops the table. Uh, and so basically, you can run the up to create it. You can go down to reset it to an empty state. What I can then do, and um, let's close a bunch of these other ones so we don't get confused, uh, is add my property to my uh, class here. And so we're going to say decimal, call it price maybe. Um, and so I basically have just added a uh, price property to this. Now, if I were to run this right now, I'd have a conflict because I have a non-nullable column uh, or non-nullable property, and I don't have a corresponding column in the database. So what I can do to enable this now, though, is I can just say add migration, and I can say uh, add product price or any other friendly name I want as part of this. Uh, when I do this, this will automatically create for me a new file in my, my migrations folder uh, that has another timestamp, so it's in order, and then it has another up and down method. And basically this up method just says, hey, you're going to add a column called price, and you're defining it to be nullable. Um, and if I now say update database, this will actually apply all the migrations. And if I hit refresh over here in the server explorer, my database now has the database schema. Um, and more importantly, if I actually open my, whoop, open my data, or not, uh, it will, my data will still be there. Um, and uh, just to prove that, let's go back to our HTML view. I could rescaffold the view, uh, or in this case here, just so you know exactly what I'm doing. Um, Oh, interesting. My keyboard no longer deletes skis. Uh, I'm not sure what just happened there. Uh, something in Windows is going weird. Um, let us hope. Yeah, can I please fix the bug? It's annoying. I agree it's annoying. Um, I will give that feedback to the appropriate person when I get home. Um, uh, but I'm going to go ahead here and uh, copy and paste... Oh, there we go. Now it works. Uh, that's very odd. Um, I'm not sure that's a VS bug or that's a Windows bug, but it's exciting that we had that in front of thousands of people. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to go ahead and add the price here into the index uh, so that now when we run this, uh, we should see listed here the price. And if I go into the create one now and copy and paste this, 